Croatoid channel of light fluid. This is Burroughs. It's not an entirely new VN, it's been out for a while, but it's uh, brand new to the channel here. And I hope you're going to enjoy it. It's um, shows it a little darker than some of the other ones I'm doing. And there is actually a content warning in the about here. It's good for things like depression, mental illness, suicides, some strong stuff there. And without giving anything away, there is uh, quite a strong illustration towards the end of this video. I don't normally give warnings like that, but I do want to warn you if anything like suicide, depression is upsetting or would trigger you, feel free to just head off now. I don't mind. I just want to give you that warning. It's in the description. I won't keep giving the warning, but it will be in the description just to uh, remind everyone. It's a very good story, or I've read of it so far, I'm really enjoying it, so don't let uh, those things put you off unless it will really bother you. It's fair enough, I have to do that actual warning for arches next time as well. But anyway, now I've said that, that's got that out of the way, let's get into the story. The wet mud squelches under my paws as I make my way through the unpaved streets of the Ninth Ward. I hold my shoes in my free hand, careful to keep them clean. I take care not to step on any of the broken bottles littering the street, courtesy of the locals. Well, I guess I'd be considered a local now by most, although I never really fit the bill. Another reason this needs to be done tonight. It starts raining, hard. Adults quickly duck inside while children scream and play in the newly formed puddles. A brave few shrug off the abrupt storm and continue drinking under the safety of their porch overhangs, waving their bottles at me as if to make a toast. I mimic the motion in return, noticing the shoes in my hand are now completely soaked. I chuckle to myself. When God decides to take a piss where you're standing, there's not much to be done about it. Something my grandmother used to say, but in that raspy Irish brogue that added warmth for even the oddest idioms. The sections of New Orleans without paved roads seem perpetually waterlogged, leaving a distinct sulphurous odour on anything or anyone that walked through them. It's actually pretty dangerous to walk on them right after a rainstorm. Tiny air pockets can create sinkholes that catch off guard if you step too hard on them. Little girl runs by in a mud-stained dress, laughing playfully as the mother closes in with a towel stretched out like a fishing net. I'm reminded of all the times me and the old gang would sneak into the city to play with our secret friends here, not caring if our new clothes got dirty in the mud. We'd wait for a carriage to cross by in the hayfield and jump onto the back, picking up other kids along the way. Sam would usually miss the jump and plod behind, out of breath and useless by the time we got into town. Me, Etienne and Charles would play soldiers, while Sam, Jules and Simone would stay behind, make us mud pie rations. One time Etienne and I climbed up to the rooftops, we tended the fence with sticks until the sun went down. Jules' hand pulled me down, I doubt I'd remember to go home. Simone always looked so glum when we had to leave. I then remember the beatings that usually follow these outings. Jules had tried to take the blame, being the oldest. The adults never bought it. We'd all go to bed hungry and with sore bottoms, pretending to feel bad but stifling laughter under our sheets, perfectly pleased with ourselves. It was hard not to laugh when the governess pretended to scold us in front of our parents, making goofy faces at us all the while. I crashed my left brakes made my reminiscing. Some cat's been flung ass over a tea kettle down the steps of a pub by the gruff-looking security guard. Any pain's hardly reflected by his dazed expression, and I can smell the reek of liquor on his breath as he locks eyes with me. As I pass by, he graces me with that toothy jack-o'-lantern grin that's so distinctive of felines as he scampers off to find another haunt. His determination is almost admirable. You know what? This whole thing would be so much easier with a few drinks in my system. Maybe that cat's got the right idea after all. I glance back at the pub. Despite the government's best efforts, Prohibition in New Orleans never really stuck. 
People were either brought their own from home or the owners kept it hidden away in their cellars. I look through the window and see the patrons inside, singing joyfully off-key, playing cards, laughing. Even the bartender was getting in on the fun. Hmm, no, it looks too rowdy. I'm looking for a soft, quiet descent into one feeling for it's time to go. I follow the river out of habit and end up in the French Quarter, walking towards the welcoming lights that dot every window and veranda. Even with heavy rain, the colour and playfulness of Bourbon Street can't be dampened in the slightest. A band playing soft jazz finishes their sets as I pass a nightclub, applause punctuated by the clink of glasses and murmurs of approval. I scan the area, looking for something more quiet, intimate. The rain picks up and I wipe a few droplets off my brow with my other hand, forgetting I've been holding a bouquet this entire time. A thorn pricks me a little, and I recoil instinctively, cursing under my breath at the stupid thing. I glance at the letter hanging from the ribbon holding the bundle together, unopened and practically turned to pulp. What the hell am I doing holding on to this? Suddenly I notice a red light in the distance, setting itself apart from the sea of orange gaslit lanterns. I feel drawn to it like a moth to a flame. The red is bright but gentle, leaning more towards the pink of a sweet hibiscus bloom than the blaze of a real fire. Getting closer I see it is actually a neon sign, the lights flickering each time a droplet hits the tubes with a sizzle. The light glows gently through the steam pouring out of the sewers below, practically covering the entire storefront. It looks ominous, this small, dimly lit space surrounded by inky black on every side. I'm not concerned with danger right now. I make a beeline for it, spotting a trash can on the corner. I dump the bouquet unceremoniously and walk up to the building. The sign's fully visible now. A simple rendition of a wine glass and the word bar underneath. Uncreative, but honest. Better yet, I don't hear the cacophony typical of a fully occupied club. Or even music. This is perfect. I walk up to the doorway, using what little cover's available to get some relief from the rain. I lean up against the door, trying to wring some of the excess water out of my shirt to no avail. Ah well. I guess it won't matter. Besides, whoever owns a joint can't expect a dry customer with weather like this. I shrug and walk inside, a tiny bell chiming to signal my entry. The inside is wildly different than expected from its humble exterior, looking more like a high roller's lounge than a speakeasy. There are tables for billiards and poker in the back, and cigarette dispensers lining the walls. Tending the bar is a tall, portly rabbit wearing a well-tailored suit. He hums to himself while drying some freshly washed glasses. He'd be totally unremarkable if not for this strange leather mask covering his face and ears. It makes his otherwise cuddly appearance a little sinister. He notices me making a wet spot by the door and waves me over with a friendly grin. Sure is coming down up there, ain't it? Sure is. He speaks in that slow, charming Louisiana drawl I grew to love after moving here. He gestures me to come sit and I trot over, my soaking wet paws making audible plapping on the hardwood floors. The bunny is needs to minor potential property damage and smiles I awkwardly squeeze on from the vinyl-covered bar stools. The feeling of my damp ass against the grippy seat sends a shiver of displeasure up my spine. I shake it off and look at the rabbit who's staring back expectantly. Anything I can get you, sir? Hmm. Can you make me a gimlet? Ah, but of course. I come in right up. He starts shuffling around behind the counter and I take a better look at him than I'm up close. He's husky for sure. But there's power underneath that cage of fluff. I can tell from the way he effortlessly shuffles bottlenecks to his fingers if they weigh nothing. Manager simply comes with a job in this part of town. Keiji looks back at me, clocking my stares. I expect at least a glimmer of disgust, the kind of homophobic recoil I've grown used to. He's still pleasantly smiling at me. With a gentle pour, he finishes my drink, complete with a gold-rimmed cocktail glass and a lime wedge. 
looks amazing. Please enjoy. Thanks. I take a slow sip. Then the alcohol linger on my tongue for a few seconds where I gulp it down. After tingling and my throat subsides, I relax my shoulders, feeling calm for the first time in days. Maybe weeks. Let's go over everything one more time, just to be sure. First, I'll find the note on my bed. I'm sure Simone will be mostly confused. Etienne will be angry. Neither will believe it. No telling what Jean will say. Either way, they'll probably try look at me right away. I'm going to head east, find some tall trees well away from the roads. And then... I look up and notice the bartender is staring intently at me. I guess I got lost in thought. Oh, it's been troubling you. Yeah, you could say that. I'm not keen on bearing my soul to a random barkeep, friendly or not. Ah, naturally. A solemn old possum slinking out of his den to drink his problems away? And on a night like this. You'd have to be down on your luck. Well, I won't pry. A man has his reasons. But please, don't hesitate to let me know if I can help ease whatever is ailing you, sir. I take great pride in pleasing my patrons, rain or shine. Yeah, right. As if this is a problem that can be simply swept away. I glance over the game tables once again. What if this was his way of convincing people to waste their money on them? Might you be interested in a game or two, perhaps? Bingo. Ah, sorry, not my vice. Mm, and what, may I ask, is... What should we choose here? I guess I just don't want to deal with my problems anymore. I try to do as expected of me. I try to go against everything I was taught to believe. I tried to repair the broken bridge between me and the people I care about. I got shamed, rejected, used. Simone just looked at me like a fragile little egg that could break at any moment. Jean only sees me as a tenant. Lord knows he's given me more chances than most. And Etienne. He just sees me as a mistake who keeps letting him stick his... I stop myself. I almost let something dangerous slip for a total stranger. Was the alcohol catching up to me? I only had one drink. Oh, it pains me to see you going through so much strife. It really does. And why are you smiling? It's... it's nothing. Forget I said anything, really. I rest my face on my hands and sigh. I didn't feel any better after saying all that out loud. Maybe it was someone who actually mattered. I feel a slight sting as my fingers pass over the scratch from those roses. Suddenly I remember. If someone named Christine comes by looking for me, can you give her this for me? Tell her I won't need it where I'm going. He takes the ring in his large paw and specks it for pocketing it and nodding. If it'll put your mind at ease. It actually does in a way. That was the final preparation. While it doesn't completely wipe away the guilt, there are no more strings left untied. That is, if you could indulge me in a simple gamble. I roll my eyes. I already told you. He stops me and holds a hand out, rolling a gold coin across his knuckles. It's nothing like that. Just a simple coin toss. I think of it as a good omen towards your travels. Before I can protest, he flicks the coin into the air, catching the light and glimmering as time seems to slow for a moment. He catches it with the same hand and slams it flat on the desk, all in one swift motion. A trick he's likely done hundreds of times before. I call it. We got a 50 50 chance. Tails.
A choice befitting of a man like you. He lifts his hand and reveals... Heads. I slump my shoulders. Now what? Shame you didn't place anything on it. Ah, but didn't tell anyone tell you some. It's the best made when you already know what you want. Well, lucky for you, I'm feeling generous today. All I ask for you is one simple task. Fair enough. What is it? Nothing about this is actually fair. But who am I to argue with a £500 bunny? He reaches under his collar and pulls out a blank playing card. He slides it across the counter to me, grinning coyly. He keeps it pressed down in front of me for an uncomfortably long time, almost as if to make sure I know it's not a normal card. I nod and he pulls his hand back, going back to polishing that perpetually dirty glass. Just keep that on you for the time being. There's someone you have to give it to. Who? Cool. Oh, well, you'll know him when you see him. Trust me. Okay, then. Well, I guess I might as well oblige. This could be the last person I talk to. He gestures towards the door before facing away from me, tends into his bar. Sounds like it calmed down up there. Better get going before all hell breaks loose again. He was right. It was suddenly very quiet. Even the sounds of people and cars were strangely absent now. It was still pitch black out, even more than before. It's been nice. Um, you can call me Virgil, sir. Hope to see you again. Yeah, don't see that happening, as funny as that sounds. Right, uh, I'll be going now, Virgil. I get up and head for the door. Even though I want to leave, I feel a sinking pit in my stomach, like something awful is waiting for me on the other side. I've already made up my mind. There's no body pussyfooting around this. I march towards the door defiantly. About halfway from my legs feel heavy, as if I'm wearing sandbags around my ankles. I almost fall from the sudden resistance, but I take a deep breath and keep pushing. The room almost seems to stretch away from me. I try to look behind me, and the view of the room refuses to change, fixed at one point like a painting. I suddenly feel the intense glare of a predator burning in my blind spot. Virgil? Goodbye, Grey. A primal sense of dread makes me turn back around and I sprint towards the door, ignoring the burning in my thighs from what feels like lifting hundreds of pounds with each step. The hallway keeps stretching an impossible distance, but I can't stop moving. I'm not with that thing behind me. My knees turn to jelly and I collapse. I can barely catch my breath. My heart is beating out of my chest. What the hell is going on? Did he put something in my drink after all? Am I going to die here like this? No. Not like this. On my terms. I grab the dirty carpet and pull myself off the floor. The door seems to stop moving away. Almost seemed to do so to pity. Bastard. I start crawling, pain shooting through my knees each time they come down. Tears are burning down my face and I resist the urge to vomit. Time loses all mean as I pathetically inch forward. Darkness fades into the sides of my vision. The idea of blacking out is sounding better and better by the second. I can't. Something is telling me not to give in. I feel something burning against my leg. Something in my pocket. I take another deep breath and gather all my remaining energy for one final dash. The shadows in the room seem to warp into exaggerated shapes as I lean forward into sprinting position. The gravity on me is suddenly released and I sail towards the door. I make contact with the knob and the room is flooded with intense red light. An impossibly loud siren blares behind me. I barely register any of it and fling the door open. The same inky black that seems to surround the building before is now staring me in the face. I swear I can see it blink. And just like that, it's all around me. 
My body is violently corkscrewed into the void in front of me. All sense of direction is gone. My feet flail uselessly searching for a solid surface. My stomach lurches and I try not to throw up. Even though I can't see, my body knows it's upside down and it's freaking out. Organs weren't meant to be in suspended animation. My limbs are going numb. Is this... Huh. I always thought death would come quickly. I begged for it. Instead, it's a slow and cruel torture, drifting helplessly as infinity passes me by. I'm given one gift. Time. Time to reflect on everything. My body's entirely numb now. I don't even need to blink anymore. I feel others here in the dark with me. They drift randomly, passing through each other occasionally. Ghosts. I feel some sort of connection with them. Our bodies are gone, but our emotions extend outward like extra limbs, caressing each other gently. I ease another's pain with a pleasant memory of my own, the first time I fell in love. This is the only solace I can offer, yet somehow it's the most important thing in the world to me. This is how things should be. Why didn't I help anyone when it really mattered? I waited and waited for someone to save me and ignored what everyone else was going through. I want to try again. I need to try again. As soon as the thought crosses my mind, my drift accelerates. I must be falling. I feel warmth return to my limbs. My bones crack and pop back to life. A glowing light surrounds me and the air vibrates with friction as I pass through layers of atmosphere towards something. I brace what has to be certain death as the ground pulls up faster and faster. But... Nothing. I'm in a grassy field dotted with yellow flowers. Dandelions, maybe? The sky is bathed with golden light, as if time were frozen at sunset. Crows caw in the distance, and a warm breeze sweeps over the beautiful expanse, eventually passing over me and ahead towards a familiar-looking building. The old house. The last time I saw it, I was looking back in disgust. Its former grandeur was replaced by peed and paint and rotten wood. The house I'm looking at now is nothing of the sort. It looked as pristine and welcoming as it did when we were kids. The sudden rush of stimuli after feeling frozen for so long makes me tear up with emotions. I wish we could have all played here, not just the other plantation kids. Etienne, Simone. Maybe even Jean if we'd known him then. Everyone deserves to experience this. I walk out towards the house and stops I hear rustling from the tree line on either side of me. I'm still on guard despite everything. I crouch in the tall grass, or it's enough to conceal my presence. Unfortunately, a blade of grass finds its way up my nose and I sneeze. Loud. A moment passes and I poke my head out to see four figures cautiously walking towards me. A well-dressed canine in glasses carefully stepping around the flowers. A hefty shark wearing ripped clothing stumbling over the uneven ground. A panther in leather scouring the other three with his arms folded. A fox so small in his ears poke above the grass, pushing his way through with worn-looking hands. A fear dissipates as they come closer. I can see how gentle their faces are. Even the feline who's intent on looking annoyed is clearly admiring the beauty of this place. I stand up and give them all a knowing glance, gesturing towards the flat area. We move over and sit down, the shark plocking down hard enough to cause a puff of flower petals to shoot out behind him. The wolf starts to laugh, we all follow suit as the bashful shark smiles a toothy grin. His teeth would be intimidating if they belonged to anyone else, but I could feel his kindness radiating at every pore. The fox clears his throat and speaks with a surprisingly loud voice, suggesting we all introduce ourselves. The panther sucks his teeth, plucking grass out by the roots with his idle hand one by one. After a moment of silence, the wolf speaks up, 
his deep voice roaring over my ears like warm honey. My name's Mark. I was just coming from Midtown, and uh, well, that's as far as I figured out. He tells us he comes from the Big Apple and works in a museum. The fox smiles, glad at least one of us is playing along. He brushes his big bushy tail against my leg and goes next. My name is Yasuhiro, but just Hiro is fine. He's Japanese, but travelled west to do contract work with a German engineering team. I nodded as he spoke, but knew this wasn't anywhere close to Europe, or any city for that matter. The shark spoke up next. I'm sh- uh, um. He sighs before continuing on, smile never fading. Uh, sorry, I'm Gabriel. Uh, nice to meet you. He's from California and was training for his college's upcoming swim relay race. Muffled music is coming from the headphones around his neck. He taps his fingers to the beat against his muscular thighs. Another moment of silence passes while Hero jabs the panther in the ribs, glaring at him. Reluctantly gives us the shortest summary yet, never looking any of us in the eyes. Her name's Ken. I'm a cyclist. That's it. Everyone seems satisfied with that answer, even only me. Um... My name's Gray. I am from Louisiana, and this used to be my house. I say as I gesture towards the building behind us. They collectively scan the building top to bottom, ending at me with a puzzled look. Gabriel scratches his chin. So, uh, do you know why we ended up here, then? Mark lights a cigarette and takes a deep drag, exhaling smoke through his nostrils. He looks just as confused as the rest of us, so I doubt it. I glance over at Ken. A decent pile size of ripped grass slips sits next to him as he notices my gaze and stares daggers back. Either way, he's got to have something to do with it. I, I swear if I knew I'd tell you guys. I don't know why I'm here either. I say this, hardly believing my own logic. Hero crawls over to me and looks deep into my eyes, his little button nose only inches away from mine. Being this close, I notice how good he smells despite his clothes being covered in dirt and machine oil. His fur smelled clean and earthy, almost medically sterile like rubbing alcohol. Hmm, I don't think he's lying. He stands up, brushing grass off his trousers. And even if he was, there's not much to gain here. I sense no malice in this place. Ken's ears perk up that last remark and he looks interested for the first time. Yeah, um, uh, me either. Mark sighs and lays down the grass, resting his head next to Hero's outstretched legs. As confusing as this all is, I have to admit, it's pretty nice here, ain't it? I take everyone's soft silence as confirmation and lay down next to Mark. The dry grass that always tickled and pricked me as a kid suddenly feels softer than any bed I've ever laid in. Mark chuckles and flicks my snout with his ear, happy I followed his trend. Soon the others join us slain in the circle. We lay for what feels like hours. Every minute feels surreal as if we were distant friends who finally met for the first time. The conversations came quick and easy, and pretty soon even Ken was joining in, albeit less frequently. The golden light intensifies, and this feeling of serenity overtakes me. I feel tears start to well up again, and I brush them away before anyone notices. I glance over at the others and feel relieved seeing them rub their own glossy eyes. Gabriel is practically sobbing, making no attempt at concealing his emotions. Ken is more insistent on sniffling and writing the ways about a hay fever. At this point I've come to accept his stoicism as him being genuine. After another few minutes of silence I speak up, my voice cracking a bit. I, 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 <coughs> I wish. I hear the rustles around me as everyone shifts to hear me better. I wish we could just stay like this forever. Everyone agrees. Gabriel's starting to blubber again. Why do I feel so sad? 
He chokes through gritted teeth. Hero turns over in his stomach and pats Gabriel's shoulder. I know what you mean. I feel Ken's tail brush mine and I glance over, seeing something that shakes me out of my cheery mood. I can see through his body. I shoot up and look back at everyone and see they're all fading away one by one. I yell. I try to reach out to them, but I'm frozen in place. I swipe where Mark's shoulder should be, for instead I hit the ground beneath. The final outlines of their phantom forms fade out, and all that's left are the sounds of gentle sobbing. My own. I'm alone again. They looked so sad. This isn't fair. I wasn't foolish enough to believe in heaven until now, but for a brief moment I was willing to believe in something, anything, if it meant we could stay together like this. I hunch over, sobbing into my arms, not caring about the mud soiling my sleeves or the snot running down into my whiskers. I stay like that for what must be twenty minutes, refusing to look at the spot where they once lay. I could tell the light was dimming through the cracks between my crossed arms. The warm air was replaced by cool, wet mist. This was how I remembered it. This is reality. My jaw aches and my eyes sting. My pants pitch my waist and can look comfortably. I can't stay here, whatever this is. I reluctantly sit up and wipe my mess of a snout off with the last clean section of my sleeve. I notice something glimmering in the grass ahead. I inch close and see three rectangles lying in front of me. The cards. What the fuck? I pick each one up and turn them over, examining the intricate art. They're pictures of Mark, Gabriel and Ken. Suddenly I feel that same warmth in my pocket again and pull out another card. The one Virgil gave me? I'd entirely forgotten about it until now. It's almost hot at this point, radiating light and vibrating in my hands as if it were about to burst. I hold up the other cards. They're the same size and shape, albeit Virgil's card was blank. I hear something from deep within me speak. I freeze. Some unknown thing within me is suddenly making their presence known. Its voice is deep and booming, so it's yelling into an empty cathedral. I should be terrified, but its message is clear. Choose one! What? Only one? Yes! That isn't fair. Isn't there another way? No response. I solemnly look down on my choices. What should I do? And this is where we have to make a decision. So, let's start on the left. Let's choose him. I sigh and grab Mark's card, saying a silent prayer for the other three. I take a deep breath and do whatever these mysterious forces obviously want me to do. I place his card next to Virgil's together in my hand. Immediately they start to glow and vibrate. I throw out my other hand to try and keep them from falling, but soon the light envelops everything around me. And I'm falling. My body is floating again. Not as aimlessly as before. Feels like I'm being guided in a specific direction this time. I glance around this new space. It's an empty grey expanse of swirling mist. The air is humid, so it just finished raining. Though there was no ground in this place, strange pillars stretch into the sky from below. As I drift past one, I see it's actually a tower of intricately stacked stones, one over the other, all the same size and shape. A car. Why do I know that word? The speed intensifies and I brace for impact again, expecting the same weightless feeling, and... 
It's cold. Ow. It's bad enough I landed on my ass, but did the ground have to be freezing? I pick myself up and see that I'm covered in snow. Not the cute powdery kind. Instead, it's the chunky frozen kind that sticks to your clothes like icy glue. A loud car horn snaps me into focus. I find myself running for a massive department store surrounded by even bigger buildings. I dust myself off and glance at the store's display window. The gold lettering reads Stacy's Herald Square. Um, wait. I've heard of this place before, but it's in... Am I in New York? Like, fucking New York! New York?! I spin around, I'm taken aback the myriad of shining jewel-like lights that dot the skyline in front of me, stretching out into what feels like infinity. People hurry past me wearing colourful winter clothing. I feel severely underdressed. The designs of the clothing are much sleeker than what I was used to seeing in the old catalogue Simone left around the house. And again, the colours! It almost looked like a doll's clothes, especially with how form-fitting everything was. I knew New York was a fashion capital, but some of these women were running around with their legs on full display. Even with stockings on, aren't they cold? The next thing to grab my attention are gigantic buildings in the distance, stretching even higher than that skyscraper in Chicago Father told me about. The Adams and the Salle. These sombre coffins of glass and cement practically reach into the clouds. Almost like those stone towers I saw earlier. Cards. I wonder if the people who work in them ever feel nauseous, or they can feel the building sway when it's windy. The idea of it makes my stomach drop and I crouch down, feeling like I wanted to vomit again. Every now and then someone would shoot me a worried glance, some even scowled. Eventually they all pressed on, forgetting me as soon as they saw me. I shouldn't be offended, I don't even know these people. It still hurts a little. Just how bad did I look? I walk back up to the display window to take a better look, but... Something is wrong. What the fuck? Why can't I see myself? Was this some kind of special glass? No, I can see everything behind me just fine. My heart starts to race. I press my nose to the glass. I look into it as my eyes practically cross. I stare a hole into where the reflection of my eyes should be. Nothing. I sink down on my knees, barely noticing the stinging snow under me. People behind me walk to where my head should be. I must look crazy. Am I then? I see more things that don't make sense pass by in the window's reflection. Models of cars sneaking anything in even my father's garage. Christmas songs they haven't heard of reverberate out of open store windows. A woman in a skirt too short to even be considered a slip, walking with a man who slips a dollar between her exposed cleavage. This isn't right. I shouldn't be here. I really don't feel like moving anymore. I'm too scared by whatever's waiting for me in this strange place. Too many variables. The metal vent I'm kneeling on is starting to cut into my shin. The snow is starting to soak through my clothes. I notice I'm violently shivering. It's the middle of winter in New York, and I'm out here in slacks and a ruddy shirt with no shoes. I know exactly why nobody's bothering to get near me. I don't blame them. Tomorrow's obituary. Unidentified vagrant possum found frozen to death outside shopping centre. Nobody from home is going to find me this far east. What do I care? I was about to hang myself from the nearest tree, remember? This was supposed to happen one way or another. My fingers and toes are numb. I can barely move. I don't know what to do. I... don't... A yellow cab pulls up behind me, stopping right between where my eyes should be reflected. 
I wipe my nose and blink back into consciousness. I can still hear a conversation back there. The driver is saying something to the passenger. A laugh. Some coins are dropped and hastily picked up. And then I see him step out. Mark. Mark? It's really him. Same suit, same shockingly long legs. Same smile. He bumps his head getting out of the cab and chuckles to himself before slamming the door behind him. He swings his briefcase over his shoulder and starts heading towards me, whistling Carol of the Bells to himself. I perk up, both happy to see him and also extremely confused. Is this real? What's all that bullshit before? I wince as I turn my body around to watch him, that numb feeling in my fingers becoming a slow burn. Watching him approach, I look for any glimmer of recognition in his eyes. He walks a few feet past me and heads straight to the front door. Ha <laughs> of course. It's exactly like I thought. I'm the one who doesn't belong here. Mark looks like he's doing fine. Why should I bother him? He slowly reaches the brass handle. Very slowly. I notice he is looking at me. Rather, stealing quick glances at me before he thought I'd noticed. Well, I look like shit, that much is obvious. Everyone else avoided me like the plague. A minute passes, he still not managed to open that door. Was it heavy or something? Was the knob too cold? I shoot him a confused glance. He stares back and looks away, flustered. Does he recognise me after all? Looks like he made his mind up this time. He swings the door open with one hand, confidently striking a pose if he's about to stride in. But he looks at me again with those worn, gentle eyes. His shoulders droop and he lets the door swing closed again. He mutters something to himself, almost argumentative. No idea what's going on, but I blink and he's in front of me. I reflexively flinch and fall on my back. Must be those legs. He cleared that distance in less than a second. He gently drops his briefcase on the ground next to his feet and bends down, reaching a paw out to me. Hey, um, do you need some help, man? It's bad out here. I could almost cry. It's still Mark. Of course he'd help me, even if we'd never met. I must have let my emotion show because his hand drops a bit in surprise. He chuckles and pushes his glasses back up his snout with his other hand. Maybe something to eat? Someplace warm? Well, I know a spot not far from here. I take his hand and he pulls me to my feet. I brush the snow off myself and try to come up with something not crazy to reply with. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, yes, I, I could really use that right now. I avoided resting him by name as that would definitely freak him out. We didn't meet for long, but even during that time he was surprisingly tight-lipped about his personal life. Guess we'll have to redo most of the formalities if this is going to be feel organic. Uh, uh, he shows his okay, okay, okay. me go oh, with you, I, I, I mean. I hold my jaw to stop my teeth from chattering. He's already turned to walk away, beckoning for me to follow him. Huh? Well, of course. Anybody has a problem with it will have a problem with me. He pauses before spinning around and gives me a serious look. Whatever your reasons, nobody deserves to live like that. Yep, he thinks I'm a bum. Well, I am out here doing my best bum impression, so I can't be too annoyed. It's not like I can explain how I really ended up here. I'll need to think of an alibi on this walk. I really don't want him to think poorly of me. He navigates the winding city streets nimbly, dodging oncoming pedestrians and hopping over potholes like some intricate dance he perfected. Those legs. All right, an alibi. Maybe I hopped on a freight train wanting to see the world and got lost here. Or perhaps my wife kicked me out for a big fight and I'm still looking for a place to... He jumped over dog poop without even looking. Wow. Um, so if I use that one, I'll need some names. I'm sure Christine wouldn't mind. We fought because... She's seen another man. Ah, we're here. Shit. I look up and see a little hole in the wall shop. 
caravan cafe. The sign is a motif of a little black cat in a Romani get up brewing coffee. I promise the coffee is better than the name. Come on. Right. A little bell jingles overhead as we walk in. We're immediately hit by the smell of cigarette smoke mingling with coffee beans. The warmth from just opening the door brings feeling back into my face, and Mark tugs at my sleeve. My regular table's further in. We squeeze past the narrow table towards the back. The place is mostly occupied by teenagers reading poetry and doing homework. Even see a few jittery college-age kids with a worrying amount of empty cups littering their table. We eventually arrive at a little white table in the back corner. Splinty leaves hang down from rows of planters mounted on the wall. There's a dirty mirror decorated with a colourful tile border where a window would be if this wasn't such a tiny place. Compared to the chaotic facade, this part of the store is actually pretty quiet. I'm surprised none of them picked this table to study. It's nice back here. Mark's ears twitch and he glances excitedly at me. I realise that this is the most casual I've sounded so far. Oh, well, I suspect it's because they get better service up front. One man's treasure, right? I nod and sit down, feeling the off-putting sensation of my wet ass against rubber for the second time today. He waves to someone behind me as an older female squirrel walks up with some menus and water. Single pieces of paper encased in plastic and not a single English word on them. Before I can ask anything, she already darted back to the counter, greets some more kids walking in. Mark chuckles and slides his menu to the side, likely having a regular order here already. He looks at me expectantly. So, how... Uh, Mark. Her uh, name's Mark. I smile a little, wondering how long you've been waiting to use that line. At least I don't have to keep pretending not to know it. <laughs> right. Well met. I tell him my name in return. He nods and we shake hands, happy to have successfully completed the first hurdle of conversation. I twiddle my thumbs, trying to think of something to say. He notices my fidgeting and places a hand over mine. Hey, it's okay if you don't want to talk about yourself yet. Are you sure? Of course. Nobody chooses to reside on the streets. I'm sure it's out of your control. That's pretty presumptuous, but I know he means well. He leans back in his seat, brushing a stray palm front off of his face. Even if it was your fault... We all deserve a second chance, especially at this time of year. I remember the music I heard earlier and assume it's still December. Christmas. It's got to be Christmas. Oh yeah, Christmas is always my favourite time of year too. Mark looks at me puzzled, his long ears perking up. Um, I'm afraid you're a day late for that one, Grey. I force an awkward laugh and look to the side. Wow, how long was I out there? I must have lost track of time. <laughs> looks more annoyed than confused now. Shit. Uh, New Year's then? He sighs and adjusts his collar. Phew, you had me worried for a second. That's on me, though. I should have considered you wouldn't have a way to keep dates. I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's fine. You're good, honest. If I'm being honest, I'd rather talk about anything else right now. That's all right. As if on cue, the waitress comes back to take orders. This is obviously the last stop in a route she hasn't checked on us in at least five minutes. I realise I haven't even looked at the menu yet. She taps her pen on her notepad impatiently. Are you too mean to our time? Sorry. I look at Mark and he picks up my naivete. We'll have two cappuccinos. Swell, I have those coming by in a few. She trots away, a fluffy tail obscuring most of her body. I sigh in relief and thank Mark for doing me a solid. I've never been to an Italian-style cafe before. Uh, cappuccino's good. Well, it's a little more bitter than French coffee, but you will notice an extra aficionado. I'm definitely no expert. <laughs> I think of all the sugary French pressed coffee we get at the bakeries back home, usually with warm beignets dripping in honey and a bag of donuts to take home. My stomach growls. Uh, maybe we should get some pastries along with those drinks? I blushed. I was probably already pretty red from being nearly frozen to death. Not a bad idea. So. Mark. Hmm? 
Tell me more about yourself. Not fair of all the questions be aimed at me, is it? That may be a little bold, but I'll say anything to get the attention off me. Huh, fair enough. Well, I'm actually an archivist at a museum. Ever been to the MoMA? Um, no, I'm still fairly new around here. Like ten minutes new. So, you work in the arts? That's a very sophisticated field. And you definitely look the part. I gesture to his outfit and he shoots me a wink. Well, it comes with a job. Well, I guess sophisticated depends on your point of view. Art is pretty subjective. A lot of contemporary works are considered challenging by our older patrons. Firstly, I want to see our galleries focus on what has the attention of the masses right now, not what wowed them over 50 years ago. A new generation is standing at the precipice of the next cultural zeitgeist. Frankly, things haven't been this exciting in the art world for ages. His amber eyes are sparkling. I can tell this is something he's really passionate about. It's really cute, especially from such a big guy. Oh yes, I agree. Art is what we make it of it, so naturally it would change as culture evolves. I've never seen a piece by Duchamp that I've tried to wrap my head around for almost an hour. I don't think I ever really got it, but I left an impression. He cocks his head to the side, still smiling but with furrowed brows. Duchamp, eh? It was revolutionary for certain, and that's not exactly uh, modern. Right now it's all about Liechtenstein and Warhol, you know. The stuff they do downtown is completely outrageous, but that's not so great about it. Huh? But that painting was in a recent exhibition, no? At least when I saw it in Philadelphia. Well, that couldn't be. I'd have heard about a Duchamp exhibit even if it were in Vienna, let alone Philly. Losing control of the narrative. I need to change the subject, but it's keeping him engaged. That feeling of something being off is rearing its ugly head again. Again, as if on cue, the waitress plops down two steaming cups between us and tosses some sugar packets at me. I shoot her an awkward thumbs up, ignoring the blatant aggression. She seems satisfied with this and walks back to a station, swatting me with her tail as she turns. Mark grimaces at her for turning his attention to the drinks, gleefully grabbing one and laughing at the foam like a puppy who hasn't learned to take sips yet. Oh, it's all right. She can be a real card some days. I don't think it's you she's mad at. I shrug and look at the cappuccino. It's pale. Is it all foam? I smile at Mark as I bring the cup to my lips, not wanting to appear ungrateful for the free food. I take a sip. It's bitter. I quickly tear open a sugar packet and stir it in, but it's still got a vile, burnt flavour. My disgust must be apparent if I hear Mark giggling. I sigh and give up, pushing the cup away. Hey, it's fine. If you don't like it, we can order something else. I know you're going to get treated like this often, so I'd rather you get something you actually like. Thanks, really. Maybe just a muffin or something. You don't need to go all out for me. Please, what could that have cost? A dollar? A dollar? Mark looks surprised. I know I've said something weird again. Maybe don't drink the fanciest imported brands. I never paid more than ten cents for a cup of joe. Everything I heard about New York is true. How do these people live? Hey, are you sure you're all right? I hastily nod, about to offer another excuse when I catch stray fragments of conversation from the front counter. The same surly waitress is yelling to the phone while angry flipping through some papers. No, no, no. I said the post should read Rain in 66 with Caroline Cafe, not Minivan Cafe. What the hell is a Minivan Cafe anyway? Does that make sense to you? Man, what a bitch. Wait, 66? There's no way this place has been open 66 years with service this bad. So... That must mean... Hey, am I going deaf from a screech? Or did she just say 66? Ah, oh, yeah, right. Hard to believe how fast this year flew by. Now it's a great year for me, so... Good riddance to 1965 as far as I'm concerned. The room feels like it's closing in. 37 years in the future? Imagine what my friends must look like now. They're all still alive. 
My parents are probably dead. That quiet notion was gnawing away at me is loud and clear now. How people are supposed to respond in this situation? Strangely, I don't feel much of anything. It's probably a normal trauma response. This is fine. I can deal with this later when whatever this is is over. Great. I snapped to attention. You went quiet on me, buddy. What's wrong? I... Um... Ray, whatever it is, you can tell me. This is going to sound very, very weird to him, but I think we should tell him. I can't keep it this raid forever. It wouldn't be fair to him. I take a deep breath and tell him everything. About Virgil and the Nightmare Bar. About me meeting him and everyone else in that beautiful place. About magically travelling to New York by means I don't fully understand myself. At all what feels like an hour, not breaking eye contact so he knows I'm being serious. Doesn't interrupt me the entire time. Occasionally he'd nod or take a sip of water. I can't read his face. Finally I finish and lean back in my seat. There's nothing else I can do now. Mark gulps down the rest of his coffee before speaking up. Well, that's certainly a lot to go through in one night. You must be so tired. So, you will leave me then? He leans forward, looking at me intently. Well, it's not so much that I believe everything you told me, but your feelings are real and that's important. And if, you, if what you said is true, you've had a hell of a day. I'm stunned. I best I expect him to write me off as another lunatic roaming the streets. Chalk this up to a failed experiment in charity and bid me a farewell. He's taken his way better than expected. I feel a little less crazy. I mean, this is real, right? We're sitting here talking and eating. There's an explanation of this out there somewhere, and I'll find it. Mark takes my silence as the cue to stand up and pat me on the head for turning to head out of the shop. We walk back out and I went to the cold air hitting my snout. It's only six, the sun's completely set. I see it stop snowing and sigh with relief. Mark chuckles and walks to the curb, sticking out a thumb. Oh, don't worry. I wasn't planning on leaving you out here again. Huh? He successfully waves down a taxi and gestures me to come over. You can stay with me for a couple of days. I have tomorrow off already. Maybe I can give you a little tour of the city. This day keeps getting more and more surreal. Regards how sketchy this would be in normal circumstances, I'm not above staying at the stranger's house. A special alternative is staying out here. That sounds fun. I'd be delighted. I'm not even lying. Apart from all the weird shit going on, spending the day sightseeing with Mark sounds incredible. I duck into the cab and he follows suit. He has to slouch so his head isn't poking into the roof, but he's probably used to it at this point. The cabbie is merciful and spares us the chit-chat, Mark only having to give an occasional comment about directions. We ride silently for a while, the fallen snow muting the cacophony of the city around us. First time in what feels like ages, I feel things are finally calm. I feel Mark gently place a hand on my thigh. I shoot him a smile, reciprocating my linking arms and placing my hand over his. Everything is so cosy. Someone shakes my shoulder. I feel drool on my chin. Did I fall asleep? Ah. Something about long car rides always puts me in a trance. I crack open my eyes. Mark's still rocking me awake. Time to get out, sleepyhead. Uh, oh. uh, sorry, I guess I'm more worn out than I thought. We shuffle out of the cab and back into the chilly air. It's evening now and the street lights are blazing. So this is your place, huh? I'm staying to a luxurious looking high rise apartment building. Must be at least 30 floors. Mark chuckles and pats me on the back. Come on, let's get you inside. I nod and follow him down the cobblestone path into the lobby. I step inside. 
It's expected to upscale place with a sign-in sheet and lobby attendant. There's an art deco scene, it wouldn't seem that added a place in my own time. Mark heads over to sign us in and makes small talk with a woman. I wander over to some tiny trees planted in the bed of little stones. I instinctively take one and roll it around in my hands. It's smooth and cool. I try to imitate the way Virgil rolls coins across his knuckles, but it's too big. I feel a hand on my back again and almost drop it. Want to see something you like? Huh? Well, no, I guess. It's something I like to do when I visit a new place. Hmm, like a keepsake? Sort of. It's something my grandmother used to do. She had all kinds of strange habits. There was always a reasoning behind them. You need to acquaint yourself with the land first so it's friendly. After all, you've had to travel on it, yeah? Better to knock first. I slide the rock into my pocket and follow him over the elevator. All the technological advancements I've seen so far, this is the one I've been the most curious about. There's no way an elevator operator will want to ride up and down in these huge buildings all day, right? The brass door's open and... It's empty. Satisfied as my correct guess, I march in and lean against the wall. Mark presses the button of the top floor and the doors close automatically. Eagerly anticipate what the rest of this place looks like as we ascend. We arrive and step out into the hallway, signed with some inoffensive landscape portraits and a few plants here and there. I follow Mark down the hall to the last door, 35E. I try not to think about how high we are. Keys jingle and he leads me inside. Welcome to Casa de Mark. Somehow there's even more out there than I anticipated. Odd paintings every shape and size hang on the walls. Sculptures of figures only even begin to approach standard anatomy are strategically placed in the corners of the living room. Tribal masks are hung over the fireplace with tiny hand-painted figurines on the mantel. I turn to look at Mark and he's practically beaming. Well, what do you think? I've been slowly buying my favourites from our collection for a few years now. If I didn't know he worked at the museum, my second guess would be a thief or a schizophrenic. It's unique. It's definitely you. Uh-huh. Uh, what's that really mean? It's all pretty beyond me, sorry. He explained some of it to me. I'd be able to appreciate it more. He nods and points to the nearest painting to me. It's an extremely abstract piece with splashes of green and purple paint. There's a single drip of yellow down the centre and little black scribbles of humanoid figures that seem placed randomly. This was done by a young bovine man down in the village. A digital showcase of local talent a few years back. Only the contrasting colours and manic energy of the piece represent social unrest caused by the poor species relations in our supposed modern society. What's the yellow represent? Ah, oh, I think a janitor was using it as a table after the exhibition closed. That's probably mustard. Ouch. Guess Mark saw something that nobody else did. I search around for another one and see a small portrait of a fox with green fur and cut out newspaper clippings where its features should be. And this one? Ah, oh, good eye. That's actually a vintage piece from the Dadaist movement. The absurdity of the image is a direct response to the pointlessness of war. This was probably done by a small group of rebel artists trying desperately to transpose their feelings about the First World War. First? There were more? I'm going to have to find a history book at some point and catch up. Yeesh. Okay, and what's with the big white one behind you? I point to the huge blank canvas that takes up most of the west wall. Mark hunches over, searching for something for pointed at the bottom corner. I squint and see it'll sit in pencil. Henry Gerber. Isn't it great? Uh, sure. He laughs and stops to wipe his glasses on his sweater for explaining. Or it's a blank canvas signed by an unknown. I found it at a flea market seven years ago and had to have it. You see, I've no idea who this person is now. But who knows? In a few years there might be a household name taking the art world by storm. So when that day comes, I'll be the proud owner of an original Henry Gerber. I can't help but smile. His endless optimism is charming. I take a seat on the couch and pat the cushion next to me. Without hesitation, he cozies up next to me, clearly happy to finally stretch his legs. It's all impressive, there's no doubt about it. I'd be happy whether you lived here or in a shit shack. 
Mark slides his loafers off and props his paws on the ottoman. I hear a few joints pop as he yawns and stretches, slightly placing an arm around me. Well, anything beats New York in winter. This is probably better than a shit shack. No, it definitely is. Decorations aside, this place was immaculate. Not a speck of dust or item out of place. Doesn't feel lived in at all. I appreciate a tidy housemate. My old roommates were slobs. Probably not a great idea to put the magnifying glass back on me. I'm feeling more comfortable now. No, oh, I bet. I don't really spend much time here, truth be told. You're actually the first guest I've had here. Seriously? I'd be showing this place off every chance I got. What about your friends? His expression softens and he looks down. Well, when you put it that way, well, I guess I don't have many of those. I feel like an ass for bringing it up. I don't get how someone as outgoing and friendly as Mark could be a loner. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't mean to... Oh, no, no, that was a normal thing to ask. I hear it all the time at work. I'm used to people worrying about me. It doesn't bother me. I lean into him. What apprehension he had with that arm behind me is gone. He gently, ha he gently hangs it around my neck. Tomorrow goes where I can find a way to pay you back for all this. I wouldn't mind being friends. Really? Are you sure? You've been nice to me all day. Do you plan on stopping any time soon? He pulls me in a little tighter. No, I don't. Good. We sit there for a while just listening to the sounds of the city and the ticking of a clock. Eventually Mark yawns we start to get ready for bed. I have to take the couch despite his protests. I assure him I'll sleep just fine and he turns off the lights. I'm wiped. My concept of linear time has completely gone out of the window. I knew that my body and mind were at its limit. I pull the sheet he supplied over me and try to relax. But my mind is still racing. I have so many things I still can't explain. And Virgil. That horrifying thing that chased me. I shudder. Let's think about something more pleasant, shall we? Mark. Mark is very pleasant. He'd be the picture next to the word pleasant in an encyclopedia. And very fucking cute. Is he into me? Are people still in the closet in the future? You were awfully close earlier, and he smelled really good. I feel something in my trousers stirring and try to change the server or I get too horned up. What are my friends doing now? Are they still in New Orleans? Did they ever stop looking for me? Did my family care? These thoughts aren't helping. I'm too tired for this. I focus on the ticking of the clock. I count the rhythm in my mind. Tick. Tock. Tick. Stirred for a deep rest. What happened? Oh right, this is Mark's place. Still dark, so it couldn't have been more than an hour since I fell asleep. So I open my eyes to check the clock on the wall. A sudden flash of light blows my vision, I rub my weary eyes. The TV, that's what Mark called it. Why was it on now? I sit up and that's when I see it. Mark is here. Staring at me. I almost fall off the couch. Mark, what are you... Is something wrong? He doesn't say anything. He just smiles at me. His eyes look blank. Was he sleepwalking? Mark? Suddenly the TV starts playing a recording. Hey everyone ready to rain in the new year? A ball is coming down. Five seconds left now. Count with me. What the hell? Mark, what was... Oh, no. No, 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 no! I 
fall to the floor. Everything is wet. It smells like iron. Blood. What the fuck was that? I can't bring myself to look at it. I hear something dripping slowly. The carpet is sticky like syrup and stained beyond recognition. This isn't real. This can't be fucking real. I fumble around to cover in my eyes and touch something solid and squishy. It's the texture of ground beef. Something awful flashes through my mind and I rip my hand away. My stomach turns and I retch violently onto the floor. The light flooding into the room is a harsh red and I feel my head start to throb. I try to get up but slip on the horrible mess of everything and bang my chin on the edge of the couch. Before the awful wet texture all over the front of me can fully register I pull myself up again. Adrenaline's kicking in. Fuck everything else, I need to get out of here. I weakly stumble over the door and try to undo the locks. My hands are shaking and slick with blood. I struggle with the chain a few times before I just yank the door open. No time to worry about a broken chain. Nothing about this is fixable anyway. I sprint into the hallway. My socks are completely soaked and I quickly pull them off and toss them to the side. I can't risk falling again. Everything here is distorted and uneven. The canvas of the paintings have rotted away. I head towards the elevator, but something has grown over the doors. Something organic. It's pulsing. No time. I look to the left and see a sign. Rooftop access. I need to get outside. Something is happening. I sail up the short winding staircase and burst out onto the roof. The sky is red. Stormy clouds are swirling in pillars in the distance. There are strange vine-like structures stretching into the sky from random points. The city's skyline isn't right. Buildings are in the wrong places. I cautiously walk over the edge and look into the streets below. Chaos. People are moving strangely, anxiously. Running on all fours, feral. Hanging off streetlights and wrecking cars. I smell smoke. I hear gunshots echo between buildings further downtown. I'm trapped. I lean against the guardrail and slide down to the floor. I can't do this anymore. I feel heavy. The panic is fading and is soon replaced by apathy. I lay there for a while. I stir. I must have blacked out again. I'm still here. I sigh and curl up into a ball. Helpless. I feel fucking helpless. It's a god awful feeling knowing you can't do anything. I can't ever feel I'm being toyed with again and again. Is this my punishment? For what? Wanting to kill myself? One of that has satisfied you? Why shed innocent blood just to fuck with me? Whatever, whoever is doing this to me must have been enjoying themselves. Virgil. That fucking lunatic. Just like me to get sucked in by a pretty face. You think I'm pretty? My whole body shudders my vibrations of a booming voice coming from above. I feel my brain rattling in my skull. My teeth feel like they're about to shake loose and I clench my jaw. I peek over my shoulder just enough to see two massive yellow orbs in the sky staring down at me like searchlights. It blinks. Oh god. That's it. I'm over my limit. My brain is going to pop. Something is leaking out of my ears and my tongue feels swollen. I think I'm sinking into the floor. There we go. That was the first episode of Burrows. I hope you enjoyed it. I have a feeling that Virgil's name is significant. I may have an idea of what's going on and why Grey is involved, but I'm not sure. We will definitely find out in the future. There will be more episodes coming along soon. Uh, Burroughs does have a Patreon, by the way, so you can, if you're really liking this, you can uh, go and support them. I'll put the link in the description, as always, has the link to download it and read it yourself. 
Speaking of uh, Patreon, I don't say thanks to all my patrons. I actually gained a couple more, which is nice, and I've lost a couple, which is given the circumstances and the way things are going. I don't blame any of you at all for dropping or leaving. It's absolutely fine. Just please keep watching the videos, even if you can't support me. I don't want you giving up on them for that. But uh, my top patrons, as always. Aaron Fox, Dan Pistachio, Exac, Monolay, Evan King, Marcus, Indri Dragowolf, Topi, Spiderling, Grizz, Dissonance, Anubis Silverwind, Ida Korval, Tiger Cub, Ryan Hall, Bastion, Lark Huskerton, Vesuxu, Cobus Visser, Kartek, and Burn Toast. And they help keep things running here. So, what next? Well, we'll be having a shift in tone uh, tomorrow, all being well, unless something comes up last minute. The always amazing Fallen Wolf and I will be back together doing A Place to Call Home live here on the channel. It's always an interesting way to do things, so you can catch us uh, on the live stream, or if not, just watch later. Coming up next week, we will have the latest update of Password. I'm going to try and get it out as soon as I can after Grizz releases it to the public. And if you've been following Password, it's one you'll want to watch. I did intend on trying to get the Tyson stuff done before then, but I kind of ran out of time. But I'll get that done as soon as I can. But definitely watch out for Password. And next weekend, on the whatever it is of September, quick math, I think it's the 17th or so, that will be the new update of Far Beyond the World, which, as I recall, this has literally just come out. So... Uh, it's going to be quite a bit of work to do that one, so I'm going to leave it till next weekend, and I will uh, get that done then. Something to look out for, and uh, it's quite a bit of singing in that one. But fortunately, most of it isn't me. Until next time, thanks for watching, Burrows. Bye for now.